All right. I want to speak to you about something in Luke chapter 9. It will bless us all, and we need it so much for our life journey. All right? So we'll stay at Luke chapter 9 from verse 59 to verse 62. And I want to briefly teach you on that. So it's like an exposition on Luke 9, 59 to 62. Because Luke 9, 59 to 62 is um, a demand Jesus makes on us. And if we will respond well to that demand, we must understand what it means or what it is. Okay. Luke chapter 9, verse 59 to 62. And he said, and that he is Jesus Christ, unto another, follow me. But he said, and that he there is the one Jesus asked to follow him. Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury their dead. But go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow you. But let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow, and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. This is our word for today, and this is what we want to eat and digest today. And I believe um, after today's session, we will be clear, especially about, about the point where the man said, let me go and bury my father. And then Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead. Does it mean that you are not to go to your father's funeral? You know, the man who didn't show up in his father's funeral, he was a pastor. And they asked him, why didn't you show up? He opened up this verse to them. He said, Jesus said that I should let the dead bury the dead, but I should go on preaching the gospel. So while I'm preaching the gospel, I can't come to bury my father. But you people who are not preaching the gospel, you're all dead. Now bury the dead. <laughs> you know, and that is how dangerous it can be if you don't understand it. Especially if you don't understand the theme under which Jesus Christ gave these statements. You know, that is the first thing you must discover. What is the theme here? And realize that the theme is following Jesus. Following Jesus. And he said unto another, follow me. You see that in verse 59. So the person's response is to Jesus has called to, for the person to follow him. You see the verse 60, Jesus' response, verse 61. And another said, I will follow you. You see, so it's about following Jesus. Whether it is Jesus calling you to follow him, or it is you yourself who have decided to follow him. It's all about one thing, following Jesus. So to really understand what this is, so that we'll respond well to Jesus' demand, let the dead bury the dead. We must first understand what it means to follow Jesus Christ. So let's look at that. What does it mean to follow Jesus Christ? You would think that we don't need uh, to consider this. Because obviously, we know what it means to follow Jesus Christ. But that is where our understanding enters into the ditch. We think that when we talk about following Jesus Christ... It's about not lying, not stealing, right? Not fornicating. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I don't lie. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I don't steal. So to follow Jesus Christ means not to do bad things. In following Jesus Christ, in following Jesus Christ, there is that case, all right? It's like in going to school, you go with your canteen. In going to school, you go in a school uniform. In going to school, you must not soil your school uniform. In going to school, you must get to school on time. But that is not what it means to go to school. Are you realizing that? Yes. 
to go to school is to be educated, is to receive education. But there are some attendant things, like your school uniform must be ironed, well pressed, it shouldn't be crumpled. So instead of understanding that going to school is getting education, following the Lord in that sense, you are understanding that going to school means appearing in a school uniform, going to school means appearing in a school uniform that's not crumpled, going to school means being punctual before le lesson starts. That is what some of us think. Following the Lord means you don't steal, following the Lord means you don't lie. That, that is what we think. And you see, I've already told you that there is a place for that, right? So I'm not speaking against that. But the danger is that it causes us actually not to realize what it means to follow God. And because we don't realize what it means to follow God, we will end up not following God. So we say that, oh, to follow God means not to lie, not to steal. Yet, we are not lying, we are not stealing, but we are not following God. You, you cannot tell me that those spiritualists, those religious beings in Asia practicing Eastern religion, some have lived all their life and they've never entered into sexual perversion. They've never known a man, never known a woman. They've been virgins for about 50 years in celibacy. Some have never stolen before. You can't tell me that because they observe such things, they are following Jesus Christ. So that cannot be the singular factor that distinguishes one from another to be a follower of Jesus Christ. That is not the mark of a follower of Jesus Christ. Again, I'm not speaking against that. I hope you realize that. I just want you to stop being familiar with this expression, follow Jesus Christ. So that the next time you sing the song, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. You really know what it means to follow Jesus. So what does it mean to follow Jesus? When we talk about following Jesus Christ, think about purpose and direction. Think about purpose and direction. Think about what? Purpose and direction. Again? Purpose and direction. One more time. Shout it, purpose, purpose. And, direction. and direction. These are the two key words you must understand in relation to what it means to follow Jesus Christ. The Bible teaches that definitively, definitively, to follow Jesus Christ is purpose-driven and not activity-driven. To follow Jesus Christ is not activity driven. So you can't define what it means to follow Jesus Christ by, by touching on certain activities. I don't steal. I don't lie. Right? Yeah. Hmm. Rather, the scriptural definition of following Jesus Christ has purpose at its center. It has purpose at its center. When you read Mark chapter 4 verse 19... Mark chapter 4, verse 19. It is the first time the concept of following Jesus Christ was presented in the New Testament. It is the first time Jesus Christ himself told anyone in the New Testament to follow him. So according to the principle of the law of first mention, as one of the tools in aiding proper scriptural interpretation, this stands as one of the fundamental understanding that governs the progressive understanding of what it means to follow Jesus Christ throughout the scripture, throughout the New Testament. So under the New Testament dispensation, to follow Jesus Christ is what? Purpose-driven. The statement Jesus made, he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. 
So according to Jesus Christ, to follow him is to respond to the call to pursue becoming what he has desired and designed for you to be. By sticking it out with him, no matter what happens, acknowledging that he is the only one that can make you what he wants you to be. That is what it means to follow Jesus Christ. I repeat, to follow Jesus Christ is to pursue becoming what he has desired and designed you to be. By sticking out with him, no matter what happens, as the only one who can make you what he wants you to be. So when Jesus Christ told Peter, follow me, what he meant is that stick out with me. No matter what happens in life, no matter what happens around you, no matter what happens within you, no matter matter what happens known to you, no matter what happens unknown to you, just stick it out with me. Just stick around me. Just stick with me. As your decision, your resolve, to pursue what I desire you to be and what I've designed you to be for myself, knowing that I'm the only one who can make you such. Are you getting it now? So at the heart of Jesus' call for us to follow him under the New Testament dispensation is to pursue what he wants us to become. And firmly resolving never to let him go. Because he's the only one who can make you what he wants you to become. So if we don't take time to teach this well, believers will parade around saying they are following Jesus and the understanding is that I'm following Jesus means I don't go to club. I'm following Jesus means I don't drink alcohol. I'm following Jesus means I don't lie. And I've told you that these things are in the package down the line somewhere. But they are not committed to pursuing what Jesus wants them to be. And they are not holding on to Jesus as the only one who can make them what he wants them to be. Are you getting it now? So you can't say that you are following Jesus if you don't know what Jesus wants you to be. That one, you, you can't say that. So an example of this understanding of following Jesus is in the Old Testament, referring to the call of Elisha to follow Elijah. We find this in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 20 to 21. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 20 to 21. In this, you see that Elisha was a farmer who was plowing his field and Elijah came to Elisha, threw his garment over him as a sign that he's calling him to come under his authority, to come under him, to eventually have on him the authority on Elijah. That is, he's called to follow Elijah so that he will end up as the prophet just like Elijah. So he understood it. He understood what it means to follow Elijah. So he told Elijah, let me go and say one or two words to my family members. (laughs) Then Elijah said, what have I done to you? Go your way. Then he went to burn all his instruments and followed what? Elijah. That's what the Bible said. That expression, follow Elijah, means he stuck with Elijah as the person who can make him what he must be. Understanding that following Elijah is for the purpose of becoming what Elijah is. So to follow the Lord is for the purpose of becoming what the Lord is. A follower of Jesus Christ is someone who is pursuing becoming just like Jesus Christ.
And there is no way he's letting go of Jesus Christ because he knows it takes Jesus Christ to be like Jesus Christ. If you want to be a farmer, will you go and see a carpenter? If you want to be a teacher, will you go and see a nurse? If you want to be a doctor, will you go and see a mason? That is it. So following is for what? Reproduction. So if you want to be a carpenter, you go and follow a carpenter. If you want to be a doctor, you go and follow a doctor. According to God's arrangement, God's purpose for Elisha, Elisha is to be a prophet. So Elisha has to go and follow Elijah. According to God's arrangement, we are all to be like Christ. That's what the book of Romans chapter 8 tells us. For those he foreknew, he knew ahead of time before they existed. Like he told Jeremiah, when you were a clot of blood in your mother's womb, I knew you. Before you were formed, you were ever conceived. I knew you, I called you and ordained you, a prophet to the nations. So we that he foreknew, he predestined, he set our destiny ahead of time. And what is that destiny? To be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. So to follow Jesus Christ is to pursue what he has designed and desired us to become. Which desire is to become just like him? Which design is to become what? Just like him. And what it takes to become just like him is he himself. So following him is following that which will make you what you must be. So when you sing, I have decided to follow Jesus. It means you have decided to become what you have been destined to become, which is Jesus, like Jesus Christ. And you have decided to follow that which will make you what you must become, which is Jesus Christ. So when you think about it and you say you will follow up Jesus Christ, at the heart of it is purpose. Which purpose is becoming like Jesus Christ? I have decided to follow Jesus. Do we have followers of Jesus here? Yes. What I mean is that we have people who have seen that the Father's design, designed for them is to become just like Christ. Yes. They have accepted it and they are living to become that. Yes. And they are sticking it out and sticking out and sticking around what it will take for them to be that, which is Jesus Christ. Isn't it not wonderful? Yes. Then shout, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Yes. Shout hard, I'm a follower. I am a follower. I am a follower. I am a follower. So this is what is happening. When Elisha was called to follow Elijah, he had two choices. If he, decide, if he decides not to follow Elijah, he will end up as a farmer. But if he decides to follow Elijah, he will end up as what he has been called to follow, a prophet. So you become what you follow. But Elijah's destiny, Elisha's destiny is to be what? A prophet. So if he doesn't follow, he will not realize his destiny. And do you know that one man having the chance to live again is embedded in Elisha responding to his destiny. In Elisha following Elijah. Because when Elisha was dead and gone, I'll teach you about the anointing. The anointing is material, it is real. And the anointing that rested on Elisha was well developed by Elisha so much that it saturated, it surcharged Elisha's whole being such like that it rested in his bones. And when the spirit left the body, the residue was still in the bones. But it hadn't been challenged with a need yet. When accidentally some people were burying a dead person, found the enemies coming, so they wanted to hide the dead person they were burying. It may look like people are avoiding you. But what it may be is that through they trying to get rid of you, they will throw you into a region that will cause you to contact an anointing. That will make you come alive. Hallelujah. That's what happened. So they tried to get rid of him. So they threw him into where they didn't intend to bury him. And it was into the sepulchre where Elijah was, Elisha was buried. And when that dead body Tight Elisha's bones. No word was uttered. 
no decree was made. I'll teach you about the anointing. Do you know what it means to come back to life? When you die, your spirit goes to one of the two everlasting dwellings, either heaven or hell. So to come back to life means your spirit is called back from wherever it went to rest and enters your body again. It's at that point your heart comes alive, your lungs come alive, your body begins to live again. No prayer was said, no decree was given. When the body touched the bones, wherever his spirit was, was called back. And entered the body and it came alive. It means there is an anointing. Eh? The anointing itself is a judicial statement. The anointing itself is an authority at rest. Such that when that anointing is contacted, divine authority is invoked. It's like a prayer has been said. A command has been given. Maybe this man's wife was dejected. Maybe this man's children were demoralized. Such that without the father, their life would have taken a turn that would be difficult to recover. But because Elisha decided to follow to become what he was made to be, when all hope was lost, it turned the life of a whole family around. That is the power of following to become what you are to be. Hallelujah. 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 Yeah. The other understanding of following is that following the Lord is directional. Following the Lord is directional. That's why I told you to understand following the Lord, always hold in your mind these two words, purpose and direction. It's directional. When you read Revelation chapter 14 verse 4, the last book of the New Testament, we saw a fundamental understanding of what it means to follow the Lord in the first book of the New Testament. We are seeing another fundamental understanding of what it means to follow the Lord in the last book of the New Testament. Revelation chapter 14 verse 4. These are they which are not defiled with women for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb wheresoever he goeth. So here, the expression of following the Lord is directional, isn't it so? It says they follow the Lord wheresoever he goes wheresoever. The Lord told Peter, follow me and I'll make you. I mean, the following is what? Purpose driven. But here it says that these people followed the Lord wheresoever he went. It means the following is what? Direction driven. Directional. Jesus said in John chapter 10 verse 27, My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. What did Jesus mean? He said, they follow me. Imagine a sheep following a shepherd. When a sheep is following a shepherd, what do you see? The character of the following is what? Directional. Isn't it so? Yes. They follow the shepherd wherever he goes. It means they take the direction the shepherd has taken. If the shepherd is heading east, that's their direction. They head east. For the shepherd to head east and for them to head west is no more following. So when he says you are following the Lord, it means you have taken the same way he has taken. And actually, that is the very meaning of the Greek word used for follow. It is akuleteo. And if you have read the book, The Way of the Cross, I explain that briefly. And akuletheo means to be in the same way with. To be in the same way with. Come, um, Erica. So if we say that Erica is following me, what do you mean? I mean this way, isn't it so? Come. So if Erica is following me, where is, where is she? She's in the same way with me. So if I come down here, is she still following me? Oh, yes. uh, it means she's in the same way with me. If I go here, she's in the same way with me. Yeah. That is what it means to follow the Lord. You can take your seat. To follow the Lord means to travel with the Lord in the direction that he's going. To travel with the Lord in the direction that he's going.
And when we talk about direction, we are talking about goal. Isn't it so? What the Lord is getting at. What the Lord wants. His will. You see, the death of Jesus Christ is towards something. So Jesus Christ worked towards a specific point. It's directional. And what is, what is the direction of the death of Jesus Christ? What is it towards? That souls will be saved. Isn't it so? Yeah. And that his church will be built out of that. He said, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That is the goal of Jesus Christ. So to follow the Lord means that you are pursuing the goal he's pursuing. For the Son of Man is come to seek and save what? The lost. That is the goal he's pursuing. That is what he's after. So you are also after what he's after. Now if Jesus is running after this drum, that's what he's after. And you are also running after him after what he's after, then you are following him. You are all running after the same thing. That's the follow of Jesus Christ. You can say, I don't steal, I don't go to club. Yet you are, you are not running after what Jesus is running after. You are not a follow of Jesus Christ. He goes into the world seeking for souls. You sit in your room, eat kebab, drink Coca-Cola, and watch telenovela. And you say, oh, because I haven't lied to you, I'm a follow of Jesus Christ. The one you are following is not sitting in that room eating kebab. He is in India seeking for souls. Where are you? You are Trazako. Peza in one hand, kebab in one hand. And the sad thing is, after eating all this, you have running stomach. Then you say, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I've stolen no one's money. But we arise with a proper understanding of following in Jesus' name. Amen. Say, I'll follow. I will follow. I will follow. I will follow. It means you will go after what he's going after. If he's going after souls, you are going after souls. You are in the same way with him. Yeah. <laughs> like his disciples said, let's go and die with him. That's what it means to follow. If he's going to die, we will die with him. He's knocking on doors, seeking for us to receive him. We chase that with him. He's a soul chaser, a heart chaser. If we are his followers, we are also soul chasers with him. Heart chasers with him. That is where he is. Jesus is not in building of stadiums. Jesus is not in building of nightclubs. Jesus is in building of souls. Jesus is in building of churches. That is where he is. And we as his sheep, we hear his voice and we follow him. We follow him. I see you becoming a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. Amen. You run after what he's running after. Amen. Paul said a sad thing. It's one of the few sad statements in the Bible. Where he said that everyone seeketh his own and not the interest of Christ. Yes. One of his own co-workers left the work and went to chase his own interest. That's what made him make that statement. So what the person did is that the person stopped following Jesus Christ. You see, you can still be a believer in Jesus Christ, yet you have stopped following Jesus Christ. Yes. And there are many believers in Jesus Christ, but there are few followers of Jesus Christ. They believe in him. He's the Savior. They believe that his blood saved them. They haven't denied him. If they die today, they'll be with him in heaven. But the thing is that they are not pursuing what he wants them to become by holding on to him who will make them become what he wants them to become. And they are not <laughs> walking with him towards the things he wants or towards where he's traveling to. But they are believers, all right. But what God wants for all of us is to believe in him and follow him. Go with him. 
I see you going with him. Amen. I see you desiring what he desires. Amen. I see you wanting what he wants. Amen. I see you chasing after what he's chasing after. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Kabo, Zanzu Nashte. He one day called his disciples. He said, Come and watch with me. He didn't say, Come and watch for me. We can't pray for Jesus. Imagine, let, come, let's pray for Jesus. Do you have We are going to pray for Jesus. We are, going to pray for, we are going to pray for him that the Father will comfort him. Jesus, we have bread. We have bread. The way he died for the whole world, but people don't want to receive him. We are come to pray for Jesus. No, that's not what it's about. <laughs> you can't pray for him. But rather, he says that come and watch with me means come and pray with me. And that's a privilege. Pray with me. But when he returned, those who were to be in the same way with him were snoring. The Lord has called you to follow him in the way of prayer into the regions of Pakistan, to the regions of Iraq, the regions of India. You don't need to travel there, but that is where the Lord is facing. Praying for those regions, will you also be with him? Will you be in the same way with him? Today, I came to call you to follow the Lord. I came to call you to live the rest of your life following the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. A story is told of how Paul died. Paul was running away from a community. Then he saw the Lord. And when he saw the Lord, the Lord like he was crucified. Then he said, my Lord, have you come to be crucified again? He thought like, he saw the Lord crucified. But then he realized that it means that it is time for him to die as his Lord died. So he went back to the community and that's where he was crucified. And when he was crucified, he said he's not fit to be crucified like the way his Lord was crucified. So he asked that he should be turned upside down. The, the way the Lord was facing is that I am not leaving this town. I'm in this town to make a statement of my love through your life by your death on the cross. He said, Lord, I'll follow you. I'll be here. That's what it means to follow the Lord. <laughs> oh, Kabusha, give us the spirit of following. Amen. Lord, give us the spirit of following. Amen. Make that your prayer. Lord, give us the spirit of following. Lord, give us the spirit of following. So you are, you are, trying to re you are beginning to realize that in following is intimacy, right? It's oneness with him. Where he is is where you are. What he does is what you do. How he feels is how you feel. What he thinks is how you think. You, you, you can't say that because you don't still, you are following the Lord when you are not one with him, when you are, you are not intimate with him. When his heart towards the Taliban is that of brokenness, sorrow, and in, intercessory petitions, and your heart towards them is judgment, yet you have never drank alcohol before. You are not following. You are not in sync. May the Lord restore the true spirit of following in our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. What this world needs, what our community needs, what our family needs, are followers of Jesus Christ. Now, let's continue the building. We are trying to really understand what Jesus said, right? So the first build up is that we must understand what it means to follow. So now, apply the meaning of following to this contest, when the Lord said, come follow me. And I understand why they made excuses. <laughs> because of what is involved. It's not something you can do half-heartedly. It is something that demands that you lose what you presently are. You lose where you are presently facing, which is not what he wants you to be, and which is not where he wants you to be. So in the flowing begins with losing. You haven't given up anything. And you are laying hold on activity to say that you are following Jesus Christ. That is not it. But the thing is that what is the point of following? What, what do we follow the Lord for? 
We need to realize that so that we'll appreciate the statement Jesus made. That he who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit what? For the kingdom. It means that when the Lord called that man to follow him, what he was actually calling him to follow him for is what? The kingdom. So if you don't follow him, then you are not fit for what he has called you to follow him for. So following the Lord is for something. When you follow the Lord, at the end of the day, there is something you will have. If you don't follow him, you are no more fit for what you were to have for following him. That's one understanding we must capture in this scripture. And I hope you are capturing it. Because he called him, follow me. He said, let me go and do this first. Then the Lord said, he who puts his hand to the pen and looks back is not fit for the kingdom. It means when he said, follow me, it is him we are to follow. But if you follow him, we will have something. And those who don't follow him, they won't have it. And what is that? He called it what? The kingdom. So let's now understand that. Because it is the motivation for following. So his disciples asked him in Luke chapter 9 verse 62. Sorry, in Matthew chapter 19 verse 28. His disciples asked him in Matthew chapter 19 verse 28. In verse 27 was their question. Let's start from verse 27. He said, Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all. I told you following begins with forsaken, right? We have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? Peter understood that following the Lord is for something. When you follow him at the end of the day, you will have something. Now we have followed you. It is you that we have followed. What will we have for following you? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, the regeneration is restoration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, you shall also sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. The Lord is saying that since you have chosen to follow me, there is a time that you have something. What is that time? He said, when the Son of Man shall sit on the throne of his glory. Let's try to discover that time. What is the time that the Son of Man shall sit on the throne of his glory? The Son of Man is Jesus Christ, right? I mean, there is a time coming he will sit on the throne of his glory. But the question is, is he not already sitting on the throne of his glory? Because when he died and resurrected after the third day and ascended, he was made to sit on the right hand side of the Father. Isn't it so? And that is the throne of glory. So he's already sitting. But how come he says that when he come and sits on the throne of his glory? Let's look at a portion of scripture that this statement was made apart from Matthew chapter 19 verse 28. Let's look at Matthew chapter 25 verse 31. Matthew chapter 25 verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, he shall sit upon the throne of his glory. So this will happen when he returns to the earth. Isn't it so? What you call the second coming of Jesus Christ. That means that the throne of his glory he will sit on is upon the earth. So now he is sitting on the throne of his glory in heaven at the right hand side of the Father. But he will come and sit upon the throne of his glory here on earth. That time, let's read verse 34 of Matthew 25. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So when he sits upon the throne of his glory on earth, he is to usher in his kingdom on earth. That is when he will let some people who were found faithful during the great tribulation will allow to be part of that kingdom on earth. Isn't it so? So I've just guided you with scriptures. Hence, for you to see that we are talking about the time where Jesus Christ will reign on earth physically for a period of what? 1,000. It is in the agenda. That is the time he will sit on a throne on earth. And a throne is a symbol of what? Ruling. So one of the chief symbols of the reign of Christ on earth physically 
like the way President Akufuado is ruling as president on Ghana, over Ghana now, is that he will sit on the throne of his glory. When you read that, it's talking about what? The 1,000 year reign of Christ. So it is at that time that the Lord will let those who followed him have something. So when he said that he who will not follow him or he who puts his hand to the plow and loose back is not fit for the kingdom. The kingdom there is the reward for following him. And the reward is what? The kingdom on earth. The 1,000 year reign of Christ on earth. If you're a believer here, you must understand that. So according to God's understanding, according to Jesus Christ's plan and arrangement, the 1,000 year reign of him on earth is a reward for those who follow him. When we talk about the rewards for the Christian life, we talk about the crown of righteousness, right? So we next crown. We talk about crowns. Yes. And last week I explained to you that that crown is a symbol of honor. It's not that literal crown will be on your head. Though there will be a symbol of that. But it speaks of honor of position. Honor. He will honor you with authority in his administration. Right? Now today I want you to understand that when we talk about Jesus Christ has come to reign on earth for 1,000 years. He has in his arrangement, made that 1,000 year reign as his reward for those who will be following him now. So when you think about the rewards you receive from Jesus Christ, think about the 1,000 year reign as one of them. Are you with me? Yeah. Speak in tongues for some 30 seconds and speak it very strong. Hallelujah. So let's try to build a brief understanding into the 1,000 year reign of Christ, given as a reward to those who follow the Lord now, to those who pursue what the Lord has desired and designed them to be, and hold on to the Lord as the only one who can make them what he wants them to be, and to those who follow the Lord in where he is now, in what he's involved in now, in what he's doing now, where he is, that is where they are. Feel what he's feeling. Think what he's thinking. Souls, souls, souls building his church. Do you get the framework? If you get it, say, I get it. I get it. If you don't get it, say, I don't get it. Okay. Then shout again, I get it. I get it. Okay, so let's get more of it. That 1,000 year reign of Jesus Christ. Why is Jesus Christ coming to reign on earth for 1,000 years? If he's coming back, why can't he just destroy any, everything evil and just start afresh? Isn't it so? That seems better, right? But that's not how it must be. Because from the very dawn of man's existence, the reason why God made man when he made man and the first place he puts man, he chose to put man, is the earth. And when you talk about the earth, you are talking about the place of the natural realm. The natural realm is very vast. It includes mass. That is why natural men have made natural space shuttle, have used natural um, energy, flown that natural space shuttle into mass, because mass is also part of the natural realm. They have gone to the moon and their feet have touched the moon because the moon is also part of what? The natural realm. But the headquarters of the natural realm is the earth. The natural realm involves galaxies and one of them is the Milky Way galaxy. And in the Milky Way galaxy is the earth. So the natural realm is very big, but the headquarters is the earth. And the man who was made to be the Lord over the natural realm is Adam in his generation. So the Lord first charged Adam to set his headquarters in order. I don't have time to go into the state of the headquarters for the natural realm when Adam was introduced to it. But it was a mess. So much that there was a need to subdue it. So much that there was a need to replenish it. 
The word replenish, another meaning for the word is refill. You see, some of you have worked with printers before. Printers, they use some use cartridges, right? And they use ink. And the ink runs out. When the ink runs out, what do you do? You refill it, right? Doctors, you work in the office, right? You refill it, right? So we have special places where they refill ink. Isn't it so? Aha. Uh-huh. Now, to refill means that the thing was full already and it has been depleted. So now you are going to refill. So when the Lord said replenish the earth or refill the earth, it means the earth was once plenished. But now it has been depleted. So Adam has come on the scene to replenish it. That's restoration. That is recovery. Isn't it so? Yeah. That's Adam's work. Not Jesus Christ's work. Jesus Christ, before he became Jesus Christ, is the word of God. His work is creation. By him was everything made that was made, and without him was nothing made that was made. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. So, because of that, man must replenish this earth. That agenda is not cancelled. Immediately Jesus cancels that agenda, he has been defeated by the devil. Why? Because the devil has made Jesus to change his plans. The plan of God is that man will replenish this earth. But because the devil tempted man for man to fall, the Lord has taken that off the table. He would have been defeated. And scripture would have been broken because the Bible says that. He's in one, he's in one mind. Who can change his mind? If he says that this is what he's doing, no one can change him. Because he doesn't make bad decisions for him to, for him to repent from them. Whatsoever the Lord does is good. So it is on the Lord's agenda, and it is very big, it's a very big agenda, that man will restore this earth to the level of the glory of God. Man will restore this earth. Like, this whole earth will look like the Eden God made for man. So God made, you see, when you are building, when a church is doing a building project, sometimes for, for the church members to get what they want to build, they make a miniature of the whole plan. Isn't it so? There is a name they call it. Come again? Yeah, but it has a name. So if you mean they want to build a city, they will show everything. Uh-huh. So that as they see it, I grew up in a Catholic church. So one of our building projects is very nice. They set it in that niche. So the whole church, every Sunday we see it. Every day we see it. So we were so clear about what we are going to build. To the last detail, where the grass will be planted, they are all there. Yeah. So we have the model in mind. When God made Eden and put Adam there, made a garden in Eden and put Adam there, God just created a model that Adam, this earth that I've given to you as your house, your headquarters, the quarters of the head of the natural realm, that you are to recover, restore, rebuild, replenish. This is the building plan. This is the model. It's like this. And all the elements you use are here. It's like this. But before Adam could expand, <laughs> the devil had upset it. But God cannot be defeated. Hallelujah. 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 So man must make this whole earth like Eden. Say it is our responsibility responsibility to turn this earth earth into the garden of Eden. Eden. And that's what the season of the 1,000 year reign of Christ is for. It is for turning this whole earth, every single part of it, into Eden. Yes. So when you read Isaiah chapter 61 verse 4 and Isaiah chapter 51 verse 3, it gives us the theme of the millennial reign of Christ, the rebuilding of the earth. Isaiah 51 verse 3. Let's look at Isaiah 51 3 first. For the Lord shall comfort Zion. He shall comfort all her waste places. He will make her wilderness like Eden and her desert like the garden of the Lord. If you can give this to us in the latest, maybe amplified or uh, easy to read English, because that comfort is not like the comfort you understand. That we have used to name our sisters, sister comfort, auntie comfort. No. It means to build. 
It means to strengthen, to rebuild. So what he's saying is that, please, after what I have said, what he's saying is that the Lord will rebuild Zion. And, and when this prophecy is given to the Israelites concerning when the Lord Jesus Christ will come as their real David to restore the kingdom to them. And when he comes, what he will do is that he will rebuild all the waste places of Zion. He will restore Israel to the glory that they are to have in God. And the Bible gives us some definite features. And it tells us that what the Lord will do is that definitely all the wilderness will be like Eden. And her deserts will be like what? The garden of the Lord. So the model is that this earth, Israel, now he's using Israel as a case study. Israel will be rebuilt to look like Eden. Like the way Eden was before man fell. This why I'm reading for yourself. It doesn't need interpretation. <laughs> yeah. Isaiah chapter 65 verse 20, 20. Sorry. Isaiah chapter 61 verse 4. Isaiah chapter 61 verse 4. And they shall build the old wastes. And they shall raise up the former desolations. And they shall repair the waste cities. And the desolations of many what? Generations. Now, you realize that. We read in Isaiah 51. It said that it is the Lord who rebuilt Israel to look like Eden, the garden of the Lord. But here, he's saying that the people will rebuild Israel and all its waste places. Are you realizing that? Yeah. So the Lord will do it, but the Lord will do it through men. And if you study this, go home and study Isaiah 61. He's talking about the, the time for this is the millennial reign of Christ. So what is going to happen is that when Jesus Christ returns, just as he will do for Israel, that's what he will do for the whole earth. So, you have, some of you have a picture that when Jesus Christ returns, he will just put his feet on the earth, boom, and everyone will be filled with green grass. You can afford too much cartoons. You can afford too much cartoons. And he will just wave his hands, boom. And all the houses that are not nice, they have not been painted, will, will change and will look like nice castles. No. No. He's not coming to do that. Every house that is not nice, Right? Every place that has no green grass will be filled with green grass through <laughs> rebuilding. Like the way we build cities now. That's how we rebuild the earth then. Glory to God. Glory to God. So life in that millennial reign will be the busiest time on earth yet. You think we are busy now? We are busy for nothing. But then we'll be busy for something. Yes. The Bible tells us that when it comes, some, sometimes you imagine 1,000 years, what at all will be happening? It will be boring, no? No, it will not be boring. It will take 1,000 years for us to accomplish every part of this earth looking just like Eden. So the Bible tells us that every part of society will be reshaped if the political system will change. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 9. Like the way we have president MCs, it will change. Jesus Christ will be the universal president, and under him will be people he will be ruling with. The structure will change. Yeah, there will be employment. Ezekiel chapter 39, verse 8 to 16. Ezekiel chapter 39, verse 8 to 16. There will be employment. Okay, let's look at some, some, some people have been seen it for the, really for the first time, so let's look at that. Let's give, let's give everyone a chance. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 9. Let's go back to Zechariah 14, 9. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. You see, so the political structure, the governance system for the whole earth will change. The Lord will be president. He will be king over all. And every earth will acknowledge that they have only one president, one king. In that day shall they be one Lord and his name one. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Now let's go back to Ezekiel 39, 8 to 16. Behold, it is come and it is done, said the Lord. This is the day whereof I have spoken. 
and they that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth and shall set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and the backlights, the bows and the arrows, and the hand staffs and the spears, and they shall burn them with fire seven years. What is happening here? This is after the battle of Armageddon. When Jesus Christ descends, like you were taught in Sunday school, he will come riding on a horse, and then he will speak a word, sword will come out of his mouth and destroy the Antichrist and his army, right? Hmm. That's, that's not all. That's one side. There will be hailstone. It will be with a lot of different things at the same time. And then the Antichrist and his armies will be destroyed. But a percentage of them will be preserved alive. Now, imagine the Bible says that the blood that will flow from men who flow the Antichrist who will die. The blood will rise so much that if a horse is standing in the blood, it will be up to the horses where the bridle is kept. And where, where do we bridle the horse? At the mouth, right? So to the mad level. No, even this room. How many human beings will it take to have blood that will rise to the nose, nostrils of a horse? How many human beings? And no blood is thick. So when something is thick, it means you need a lot. That tells you a lot of people who follow the Antichrist. Millions. It will be the largest army ever formed. Yes, it means a lot of people there, and all of, all of them will have guns. The armor cars, there will be plenty. And all of them will march towards Israel. Israel is the center of the earth, actually. And that, so they will all march towards that. If you get Israel, you get the earth. Because that's where Jesus will rule from. And that's where the Lord will come in and destroy them. After that, when Jesus comes, he won't just wipe his hands and all the armor cars and all the guns and all the dead bodies will disappear. No. The Bible tells us that the Israelites will start working right after. They will burn the guns. Are you seeing it? All the cars, all the shields, these are the instruments. When the prophet saw it, he was writing it in the time compared to instruments that existed then. But some of them represent anti-ballistic missiles, nuclear weapons. Yeah. So human beings will work. There will be employment. And it will take seven years to clear all of them. Some of you, it is one third of your age. That seven years cry. My son is not yet seven years. Seven years. That's, are you getting it? So that's a lot of work. It means men will be working like we work now. If let's say we have a big refuse dam that fills this room. And we have to pick it with shovel and a wheelbarrow to dump it away. Maybe to clear everything, everything, it will take one year. Isn't it so? It won't change under the Lord. When the Lord comes to rain on earth for 1,000 years, if, and we are clearing this, it will still take one year to clear everything. I'm trying to tell you that we are transitioning into a rain under Christ. But the way we do things on it, there will be employment we would have to get things done. And when a believer sees that, you realize that the most exciting days on earth is yet to come, and you don't want to miss that. Now you work, and when you achieve a goal, you are so satisfied, right? When Jesus Christ comes and we are rebuilding the earth, and you labor, you work, and you achieve a goal, the satisfaction you feel, you've never felt any satisfaction like that. Let's proceed. So that they shall take no wood out of the fire, neither cut down any out of the forest, for they shall burn the weapons with fire, and they shall spoil. <laughs> Some will be recycled. Essentially, that's what it means. Some will be recycled for use. And shall burn the weapons with fire, and they shall spoil those that spoil them, and rob those that rob them, say the Lord. Let's proceed. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will give unto God a place there of grapes in Israel, valley of the passengers on the east of the sea, and it shall stop the noses of the passengers. So these dead bodies, they will all be buried at one place. And you see, these are plenty dead bodies. You can't bury all of them in one day. So until the grave is dark, the dead bodies will be on the floor and they will be stinking. That's what he's saying. So it will be normal life. Still work hard to get things done. Those who don't like working hard. That's why you won't be part of that kingdom working under Jesus Christ to rebuild the earth. Because hard work is needed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I won't mention anyone's hometown. 
to say that hard work is needed to change that place into a very neat city. Amen. Amen. I, know, I mean, these things excite me. Real nation building, global building is coming. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Stop the noise of the passengers. And there, and there shall they bury Gog and all his multitude. So they will bury them. Dig grave, bury them. <laughs> and they shall call it the valley of Hamogog. And seven men shall the house of Israel be burying them. And they shall be cleansed of the land. So for their weapons and their cars, it will take seven years to clear all of them off. But for the human beings, it will take what? Seven months to bury all of them. All right, let's proceed. Yea, all the people of the land shall bury them, and it shall be to them a renown the day that shall, the day that I shall be glorified, said the Lord God. And they shall sever out men of continual employment. Are you seeing? That will be some people's work all the time. Continual employment. Passing through the land to bury with the passengers those that remain upon the face of the earth. So for some people, their work is to bury those who are dead. They wake up to go to work to bury the dead bodies. So there will be employment to cleanse it. After the end of seven months shall they search. Yeah. There will be work. And this work they will do to, they will do it for reward. Isaiah chapter 65 verse 21 to 22. Isaiah chapter 65 verse 21 to 22. It says, and they shall build houses and inhabit them. They will build houses. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But this house will be built according to heaven's architecture. Hallelujah. Yes. There are some houses that exist now. The architecture rather looks demonic. It has symbols and designs that speaks of... It has demonic representation. Nothing on earth is to express anything demonic. Not everything on earth is to express something about Christ. So God will bring the architecture of heaven onto the earth. And then they will build after that heavenly architecture. They will build houses and they will inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. So it means they will get a reward of their labor. When they work, they will get the due reward. Now, this is talking about the human beings who will be living under that 1,000 year reign. We believers will not be part. But those human beings who go through the great tribulation, they will not take the mark of the beast. When Jesus Christ comes, he's, they are those ones that Jesus Christ will usher into his kingdom that he will rule over. All right? So they are the ones who will be going to work and building their community, building their civilization. This one. Tearing down houses that doesn't represent heaven and building new ones and working and planting gardens, having great scenery in front of their houses, seeing to good tarred roads everywhere. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> there will be technology, there will be good roads. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 16. There will be the best of transportation. Even the cars will change, better ones will be manufactured. Yes. We don't need to fight about using petrol and fossil fuel and uh, air pollution. So the car will change. And what a ransom will not pollute anything. Do you know there are transportations in heaven that will be brought to the earth? In time, eternity, the earth hasn't been ushered into eternity yet. It's still in time. The natural is still in time. The natural hasn't been engrossed into eternity yet. It's still in time. And to be experiencing all these elements of heaven. Who told you that in time here you can't live as heaven on earth? All right. Isaiah 11 verse 15 to 16. There will be highways. There will be roads. Better ones. Than Dubai motorway. Yeah. And there will be great peace, universal peace. Micah 4, 3 to 4. Human life will be prolonged. People will live long. Isaiah chapter 65 verse 20. And everywhere, everyone will experience prosperity. There will be no inflation. Imagine Jesus is a universal president and there is inflation. There is economic crunch. The economy, the Ghana city 
has depreciated. No, 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 for the way. <laughs> Some of you wish you'd be human beings living in, in that civilization. There is a better plan for you. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. There will be education. Micah chapter 4, verse 1 to 2. There will be education. People will still be educated. They will be going to school. They will be given birth during that time. And they, they have to be socialized. How to read, how to talk, no mathematics, all those things will be going on. Yeah. Have I given the scripture for the global pro prosperity? Isaiah 65, 21, Micah 4, 1 to 5. All right. And, and there will still be global mission work. What the church is doing now, sending people to places to go and preach, it is the Israelites who will be doing it then. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 19 to 20. So there will still be global mission work. People traveling to far countries to disciple others in the way of the Lord. And that will be the work of the Israelites then. They will be the priests on earth then carrying out that work. But how come all this thing will be a reward to us? That's what the Bible says. It will be a reward to us. Because we will play a role in that. You see, this rebuilding of the earth and every department of society, there will be a need to rebuild physical infrastructure to look like that in heaven. Rebuilding of community and civilization, socialization, education. The, we, the Lord will use us to supervise that. Remember in the parable the Lord told in the book of Luke, he says, you have been faithful over a few things. Be thou ruler over many things. You've been faithful over this. I give you authority over five cities. That's what will happen. So believers who are faithful now will be given charge to supervise the rebuilding of cities, of countries, of continents. So you, you'll be sent there like a mayor or a governor. Are you realizing that? So your work is to supervise the rebuilding of Chicago. The rebuilding of Pakistan. The rebuilding of Asia. So you have the blueprints as it is in heaven. You supervise the socialization of the people. So we are actually towards supervising the development of a civilization for communities, for countries. And at the end of the day, they all look like one under Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. We'll be the survivors. We'll be the survivors. That is what the word of God has said about us. That is what we are here on earth for, beloved. And it should be solemn for everyone. Remember when Jesus Christ came on earth, the book of Hebrews says that that is what he said. Lo, it is written of me in the volumes of the books. I come to do thy will, O God. So Jesus knew that one of the things written about him in the books of God is that he is to come to be the sacrifice for the sins of men. Right? Just as Jesus knew what was written about him in the books, his place and his role in contributing to the agenda of the Father to secure the will of the Father, you should also know what is written of you in the books. What your role is to contribute to realizing the will of the Father. Everyone look at me. That's very serious. And a number of believers do not know. But you must know. Lo, I come in the volumes of the books. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. Therefore, he taketh away the old sacrifice. He said, sacrifice and burnt offerings have you not delighted in, but a body have thou prepared for me. Jesus is to be the embodiment of all the sacrifices his desire, and is to offer his body and his life as that sacrifice. That's what is written about him. That is his contribution to the Lord's agenda. There is something written about you. So we'll say that the prophetic word 
over Jesus' life as he was incarnated is to be the sacrificial offering. That's why John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So he lived to fulfill what is written of him in the books. We are here to fulfill what is written of us in the books. Do you want to know what is written about you in the books? Do you want to know? You see, so if someone stood up and said that a man will be sent from heaven and he will come to replace all the offerings and the Lord will demand his body and his life as the real atonement for sins. What do you hear? You call it prophecy. Isn't it so? And you wonder, who is that man that this prophecy hangs over? That has this prophecy over him. That has this prophecy over his life. How the Lord put it in the book of Hebrews is that it is written of me in the volumes of the books. It's the same thing. There is a prophecy also spoken over you. About you. That you are to come and do a particular thing in contributing to the agenda of the Lord. And the prophecy is captured in the word of God. The book of Peter tells us where the word of God is to us. 2 Peter 1.19 It tells us that we have a more sure word of prophecy. And we do well if we hit to it. If we hit to it. Say there is a prophecy over me. Say strongly, there is a prophecy over me. There is a prophecy over me. And it is in the word of God. And it is in the word of God. It is a sure prophecy. It is a sure prophecy. Yeah. What is that? Let me show you one of them. Revelation chapter 5, verse 10. Revelation chapter 5, verse 10 tells us that. Let's start from verse 9. But before we read Revelation chapter 5 from verse 9 to verse 10, let's read Revelation chapter 22 verse 5. Revelation chapter 22 verse 5. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. That is what is written concerning us in the books in heaven. That we will reign forever and ever. The word reign is rule forever. And we'll be ruling from the new Jerusalem forever and ever. This is eternity. When eternity, we are ushered into eternity, we'll be ushered into eternity and we'll function from there as rulers and we'll rule over the earth forever and ever. Now let's read Revelation chapter 5, verse 9 to 10. So, if I'm to ask you this question, what will be our administrative position in eternity? What will you say? We will be rulers. Being a ruler is an administrative position. Yes. We are children of God. We are part of his family. That is not administration. That is social family life. But when it comes to God's government... His administration will function as rulers. So you must understand it now that your place in God's kingdom is that you are a ruler. Do you know what rulers do? You are a manager. Do you understand that? You are an administrator. You are a ruler. Have you forgotten what Paul said? Know ye not that we shall judge angels. Know ye not that we shall judge angels. Some of our supervisory role will even extend over certain quarters of angels. Some of you, some angels will report to you. That's what it means by you shall judge angels. So that is your position in God's kingdom. You are an administrator. Say, I'm an administrator. I'm a ruler. I'm a ruler. Yeah. And that is our position in eternity. So when we enter eternity, what are we going to do? Some of you from Sunday school, you have had this image. 
Let's cleanse it now, right? That when we get to heaven, we'll wear a long white robe, right? <laughs> I got that right. And then every day we'll be singing, Holy, Holy, Holy. Hey, won't it be boring? But you're afraid to say it. Yes, here you have in the oh, So that's all that we are going to do. No, no, no. We'll do that. But that's not the only thing we are going to do. Is coming to church the only thing we do? No. If he says that we will administrate forever and ever, that's the meaning of rain. We will administrate forever and ever. If you don't have anything to administrate, will you be called an administrator? It's like you say, I'm a school administrator. Oh, where is your school? I don't have a school. But why are you a school administrator? I'm a school administrator. <laughs> No. So if we say that we will we'll be administrators forever and ever, it means we will have administrative responsibility. We will be administrating something every time and it will never end forever and ever. Our busiest days are yet to start. Hallelujah. Maybe those of you did business administration or public administration, you understand what I mean. Because you know what goes into administration. Or those of you who are church administrators or business administrators. Haven't you read the Bible says the world to come? The world to come. Why is it called the world to come? Civilizations to come. Systems to come. The world to come. And the worlds to come is plural. The worlds to come. God has many business projects. He's yet to start. And he hasn't started yet because those who administrate those projects, they are, they are in preparation. It is you people sitting here. Amen. You must get a full picture. That's what you are following him to have. Glory to God. Glory to God. You let's cut it short there. But let's read Revelation 5.10. Let's start from verse 9. And they sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred. So the one we are praising is Jesus Christ. And the people praising are those who have been redeemed by the blood of the slain one. By the blood out of every kindred and tank. And they are people who have lived on earth. So they are part of the tank, people, and nation. And has made us, so that's the redeemed, Unto our God, kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. So you see that another part of the Bible tells us that we who are redeemed shall reign forever. We shall administrate forever. Now this part tells us that we shall administrate on the earth. So before we enter into eternity to administrate forever, concerning various projects, the Father will cause us to enter in, we will first administrate the earth. Alright? Uh -huh. An example of that is in Revelation chapter 20 verse 4. When will we administrate the earth? Revelation chapter 20 verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, Neither his image, neither had received this mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. This is where we get how long Jesus Christ will reign on earth physically for. A thousand years. But Jesus will not reign alone. He will reign with some other faithful saints. So they will administrate with Christ the earth for what? A thousand years. Next one, verse 5. Proceed, 5, 6. But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. This is, this is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. May you have part in the first resurrection in Jesus' name. That is what you get for following the Lord. That's what I'm telling you. On such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall administrate with him a thousand years. Are you seeing it? Yeah. So everything you are involved in now, 
school, you are managing a school, you are managing a family, you are managing a church, you are managing your personal business, you are being raised in how to administrate. Administrate the earth. <laughs> Glory to God. Glory to God. I see some of you are excited. Now, the portrait you read captures those who were faithful during the 1000, during the Great Tribulation, right? But it's not limited to only them. Long before the Great Tribulation started, Jesus Christ said in Revelation chapter 2, verse 26, that he that overcomes and keeps my words unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall administrate the nations. Yeah. So, it is not limited to those who stay faithful. The great tribulation is for every believer who will be faithful. But you see, Revelation chapter 5 verse 10 tells us that everyone the Lord has redeemed, it is his calling to administrate the earth. And we get to see in Revelation 24 that we are to administrate the earth with Jesus Christ. It means when it comes to administrate this earth, to turn it into Eden, we are the ones he will work with to administrate this earth and turn every region of it into Eden. Don't you like that? And that is what he has called us to pursue being like him for. That is what he has called us to be in what he's involved in now, so winning and discipleship for. For example, Revelation chapter 2, verse 26, where he says that he shall give them power over the nations. And then verse 27. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. So the one that will receive power, authority to administrate nations, what he will do is that he will rule the members, the citizens of those nations. Now, this word rule means to shepherd. He will shepherd the people of those nations. So, if you follow the Lord, as he said, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And you go the direction he's going. You are building his church with him. And what builds his church is shepherding. As you learn how to take care of souls, as you learn how to manage people, as you learn how to build people up in the Lord for the Lord, you are actually training yourself in how to shepherd people because for the rebuilding of the earth into Eden, when he sets you as an administrator over a city, over a nation, over a county, you'll be shepherding those people. So if you don't shepherd souls now, how can you be ready to be put over shepherding souls then? You know it's not right. You yourself, you, if you're a manager of the world, you know you won't do that. You get that? So there is a direction for everything you are doing. For coming to church, for reading your Bible, for telling a soul about Christ, for raising a soul in the Lord. It has a direction. All these are training grounds for the main business. Jesus said, if you have been unfaithful in that which is another, who shall commit unto you that which is truly yours? It means that all that is going on is not the real deal. What is really ours? What is our real deal? Our original purpose? What is really assigned to us like it was given to Adam in Eden to do? That is what will be given, that is what will be given to us in the 1,000 year reign of Christ to do. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Do you like it? Yes. Do you like it? Yes. I'll keep on telling you till it becomes so fluid. All right? Yes. Let's push it down. Say, let's push it down. Let's push it down. So that you become fluid in it like John 3 16. Am I telling you the Bible? Yes. It's everything in the Bible. Yes. Yeah, that's what we are going for. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. But how come when you read Revelation 2.26 and Revelation 24, it's not every believer who will be part of this. Because you see, that is what our anchor scripture is addressing. That concerning this following and what we will get from following the Lord, we should not look back. That's what Luke 9.59 talks about. And Luke 9, 61 talks about. The 59 says, He said unto another, Follow me. 
But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. 61. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at my home, at my house. The Lord said, follow me. What he meant is that pursue becoming like me. So when he said, follow me, what he means is, now we are putting the meaning of follow me into it, right? It means, what? Pursue becoming like me by sticking with me as the only one who can make you what you must be, that is like me. And Take the same direction. Be involved in what I'm involved in. Travel the same path I've taken. Which path is building my church through soul winning and discipleship? So that I will give you the kingdom. I will give you the administration of the earth. I will give you the administration of cities and continents of the earth. So that you work with me as Adam should have done to turn this earth into the Eden it must be. That's all that is captured in that word, follow me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Then he said, but he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Look at what the Lord is calling you to. There is no one like Jesus Christ. He's even higher than angels. If the Lord calls you to be like him, by holding on to him as the one who can make you like him, is there anything more important than that? If the Lord calls you to be with him in the things he's involved in and care for what he's caring about, which is building his church, and discipling souls to be like him. Is there anything that gives greater result than this? So that by that you prepare you for your original responsibility of managing this earth as a manager under him to turn this earth into Eden. Is there anything that can give a greater reward than this? But see, what is the problem? Give 59 and 61 to me together. Because when you read, you are like, if you look at it, there is actually nothing wrong with what they wanted to do. He said, but suffer me to go and bury my father. Is it wrong to bury your father? It means the father is dead. It's not that because he says, follow me, so because I want to have focus to follow you, though my father is not dead, let me go and bury him so that I know that I don't have a father again. No. The father is dead, so he's going to bury him. Is it wrong to bury your father? In fact, if your father dies and don't bury him, me, myself, do I suspect you? (laughs) Yes. There's nothing wrong. Even Jesus went for Lazarus' funeral. Even Jesus himself was buried. So if let the dead bury the dead is what you think it is, then Jesus, we should have left him for those who are dead to bury him. Isn't it so? So Jesus has nothing against burying those who are dead. Christians can bury and must bury the dead. The next one, let me go and what? Bid farewell, which are home at my house. It's not wrong if you let them know where you are going to, in case they don't find you again. This is the reason. So that they won't worry. Isn't it so? Yeah. Don't put out posters. Mason. Gone Mason for these days. It's just courtesy. This is where I'm going to. You won't see me again for a while. Bye-bye. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. It doesn't make you evil. So what is wrong with this? That the law said that if they do that, it means that it's like they put their hand to the plow and they are looking back. Do you know what it means to put your hand to the plow and look back? Now, the plow is an instrument, and it is driven by an ox or oxen or mule. So when you are plowing, you have to keep your eyes on the plow and the animal. Because when you plow to sow seeds, right, 
So they cut a line. You know that all the seats should be straight on this line. All the seats should. One of the reasons why they will need the seat to be straight so that when the trees grow, they will grow straight is that. Have you been to a, a, a rubber plantation before? Or a um, um, palm nut plantation? They have to be straight so that they can weed under. Some are straight and the space are so wide that literally can drive cars through them. But if they are not straight, it makes it difficult to carry out such operations. Very difficult. So now, when you don't keep your eyes on the animal and the plow and you look back, before you realize, because you holding and looking give direction, keep it in that direction. If you look back, before you realize, it will be crooked. So the ground you have plowed for the seed to be so will not be straight, it will be crooked. It will be out of the course it must be in. So that is what happens when you look back. When you look back, you yourself, you become crooked. You become a crooked Joe, a crooked John, a crooked Mabel. Will you not be a crooked believer in Jesus' name? Amen. Your life gets out of course, the course it must be in. And we'll get back to the result of that. But what can cause you to chart a crooked life? What will cause you to live a life that deviates from its course? You understand deviation? Originally, what you must be is to become like Christ. Originally, where you must be is the things that Christ are involved in. And this automatically prepares you for your original purpose on earth, which is to manage the earth unto restoration to be like Eden. That is the course. That is your purpose. That is your destiny. But there is a way you can live life that will cause you to deviate from your course and become what heaven doesn't expect you to be, do what heaven doesn't expect you to do, and you end up not having what heaven expects you to have. What are those things? That's what we are looking at now. And these are some of the most important warnings Jesus gave us. Everyone lift up your head. Look, it's not in what they wanted to do. It is in the decision they made in doing it. Let's look at it. He said, but let me first. But, let's begin with but. The key words are but and first. Say but and first. Is that they said but to following the Lord. They said but to becoming like Christ. They said but to walking with Christ. They said but to working with Christ. Say become. become. Say walk. walk. Say work. work. These three are the description of the life that will not be a deviation. To become like Christ. To walk with Christ. To work with Christ. Anything you are doing that doesn't fall in any of these three is a deviation. It's out of course. What you are doing will it make you become like Christ? If it is, it's on course. What you are doing is it walking with Christ, doing life together with him, it's on course. What you are doing is it working with Christ to produce the results you want to produce, you're on course. Become, walk, work. Become, walk, work. Become like Christ. When Christ begins to be formed in you, that is when you can start walking with him. When you start walking with him, that is when you can start working with him. So when, let's say, you have gained 20% of becoming like Christ, now you can... Automatically, it will result in you gaining 20% of walking with Christ. Then you can think about working with Christ. And when you begin to work with Christ, it will be at the same measure, 20%. So for some of us, we have gained 20% of becoming like Christ. We are working with Christ 20% out of our life. And we are working with Christ 20%. If we stay there, we stop growing. 
But the more we do it, you see that becoming like Christ will grow to, let's say, 50% like Christ. Then we working with Christ will be 50%. Then working with Christ will be 50%. That's the order. Don't change it. We don't begin the Christian life by working with Christ. Hoping that through working with Christ, we'll get to work with Christ. And by working with Christ, become like Christ. So you have turned it the opposite. That's why you are struggling. Some of you should, should be shut away from work, working with Christ. So you have become like Christ to a measure. And is demonstrated in walking with him. Then we can talk about working with Christ. There's a difference between working for Christ and working with Christ. I'm not talking about working for Christ. You can work for Christ, but he's not working with you. They are different. I don't have time to go into that. You working for Christ is accepted. You know the laborer who is a who is a con, who is who is a mortar mixer is working for the man who is building his house. But the man who is building his house is working with the engineer he contracted. So the engineer came to look for you to carry mortar. But you working for is accepted. May God give you understanding in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Alright. Alright, alright. One thing I want to say to this is that some of some people haven't gotten to working with Christ. They force themselves to put up a personality, a structure that looks like they are working with Christ. If you haven't gotten to a place of working with Christ, don't start a ministry. God hasn't asked you to start a ministry. It's at the level of working with Christ. Keep on soul winning in a ministry. That's working for Christ. Anyway, there are other things, but it's another appropriate time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I know some are being blessed. Oh, yes. So, he said, but, he said, but to all these three things, he said, but to becoming like Christ. Imagine saying, but to becoming like Christ. Imagine saying, but to walking with Christ. You are saying, how can I say, but to working with Christ? But you have been doing it. You see, the word but can be used in the continuative sense. Or it can be used in the adversative sense. Here, it is used in the adversative sense. It means it is used to bring out the opposite, a contradiction. So when he says that, but he said, it means what he said is a statement against what Jesus said. It's not that, oh, Jesus, you said I should follow you. I accept it all. I accept it. Uh, and then he says, but <laughs> it's a counter statement. It is going adverse. Why are you saying but to your destiny? In what ways can you say but to your destiny? He says, but let me first. The way we say but to Jesus Say bad to becoming like Jesus. Say bad to walking with Jesus. Say bad to working with Jesus. Say bad to the reward he has for us like Esau did when he sold his birthright for a muzzle of bread. Is that he says what? Let me first. You see the two of them, that is common among them. But let me first. The second one too said, 59. He said what? But... He said, Lord, suffer me first. It is the order of priority. The issue is with the first. Is that they put that first. It's about priority. <laughs> that is where the issue is. It's what they put first. The question is, what is the first in your life. To him, his first is bearing his father, but first. To him, his first is going to say bye bye to his family. It simply means he, he has put family first. 
Now, what this means is that he, he wants to complete that phase. When he's sure that phase is done, before he will come to follow the Lord. But first, my education. I want, to, I want to do my master's. I want to do my PhD. Oh, Lord. You know, I know you have called me. I know. And this person will be kneeling down praying. I know you have called me. I know you have called me. I can feel it in my bones. Oh, Lord. I know you have called me. And you know, you know, I will save you. Lord, I will save you. I promise. Hey, Lord, I will save you. And the person will lie down. I will save you. I will be a pastor. I will do your work. I will save you. But, Lord, you see, I want to do my master's. And after my doctorate, when I finish my doctorate, then I will start listening to pastor to learn how to shepherd, to learn how to plant a church. Now go and plant a church. So as you are walking around, you haven't said you won't be a pastor. You haven't said you won't do the work of God. But first, let me finish this phase. Let me exhaust it. When I finish and I've washed my hands off it, then I, I can come to. <laughs> See, you must understand that. You should not change the priority of your life. You should not change the focus of your life. The priority and focus of your life is to become like Christ. Accept it. Listen, don't live here without accepting that. That nothing comes, takes the place of that. Anything that tries to fight me becoming like Christ, that thing must go. The priority of your life is to be together with Christ. Take the path he has taken. Walk where he's walking. And work where he's working. That's the priority of your life. So you must be very strong in this reasoning. That there are some things more important than life. I want you to say it with me. There are some things. Are some and I want you to touch your head and be serious. Like there are some things. There are some things. Don't say like a watchman who was caught sleeping and was just. Uh, ha, there are some things. There are some things. More important than life. More important than life. You are telling yourself there are some things. There are some things. More important than life. More important than life. You must grasp that. Until then, you put other things first. You change your priorities and change your focus, and it will cost you a lot. Life is not the most important thing in existence. And the details of that life, like Jesus said, a man's life does not consist in the things he has. Having marriage, having cars, having a house, having a degree. I'm not against that. I have a master's in ministry, from Trinity Theological Seminary, come go and check. My name is there. Yes. So I'm not against that. I have a car. I'm not against the car. I'm married. Look at my ring. I'm not against marriage. I have children. So I won't have them and say that. <laughs> no, 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 that's not what I'm doing. I'm saying that they are not the priority of life. They are not the focus. They are instruments, resources. They are systems for carrying out the focus of life. The reason why God gave Adam a wife, God gave Adam a family, a marriage is what? To be a help me suitable, the most suitable system to carry out his agenda of making the earth Eden is that system. So they serve the focus. You don't drop the focus because of the reason I buy frying pan is to fry egg. We don't you buy the frying pan and use it as a decorative piece, hang it on your wall. And anytime someone buys egg and bread to the house, you get upset. So but we use the frying pan to fry egg. I know, but first you must decorate the wall. That's how some of you are living. The reason why God gave the marriage is to aid the agenda. But first, I want the marriage for myself. Then society will not married. Society will not laugh at me again. Hey, I'm also married. Hey. <laughs> there are some things more important than life. And I want you to live here with these three things. There are three things more important than life. Such that if it will cost you your life, let your life go and let these things stand. Agatha, you get it. 
I'm telling you the truth. Believe it. A life is only waste and vain when these three things are absent or you put these three things as secondary in that life. Number one, a love relationship with Jesus Christ. Psalm 63 verse 3. Psalm 63 verse 3. Because your love and kindness, I didn't write the Bible. I'm not a printing press. I've never bought a printing machine before. Even a typewriter I don't have. I don't even have a printer. I don't even have a pack of A4 sheets anyway. Am I a prince empress? Am I the one who wrote the Bible? When they wrote it, I wasn't alive. I wasn't even part of the candidates the Lord could use. So, so this one, don't blame me. Let's read it together. Because, uh-huh. It's what? My ink in Kohanim. It's what? Better than what? <laughs> My lips shall praise thee. Because it means this is a reason. It is one of the reasons for stronger worship. Because if you don't get that reason, your worship will not be at the standard it must be. You look back. Because, and what is that reason? Your loving kindness. That word, the original Hebrew is Hezed. Oh, let's not get into that. That love relationship. God has for you. He wants with you. That covenant of love. It is the same word used in Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 3. I've loved thee with an everlasting love. With love and kindness have I drawn thee. Some version says with cords of love have I drawn thee. Cords of love. So what he's saying is that your cords of love are better than life. Cords of love. Love relationship with you. Oh, gami, zango duata. Ako kabisa filo. Your love relationship. Some of you cannot get it. Better than life. And there are ways we express our love relationship. One of them is gathering together. The second most important thing is the word of God. Important than life. The word of God. Job 23, 12. This one, I'm just telling you the Bible. Job 23, 12. I'm not the one who said it. So if you want to argue, go home, open your Bible and argue with your Bible. Why is pastor telling us this? Does pastor know? The pastor, no, please. Why is the Bible telling me this? Ask God. God, you do know. Neither have I gone back from the commandments of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary. In the original, food is not there. So if you check your Printed Bible, food is in italics. So what he's saying is that he has esteemed the word of God more than his necessary. What are the necessities of life? Then they just added one necessity, food. But the necessities of life include breathing. He's saying that the word of God is more than every single necessity of life. The word of God is necessary than your necessities. If you don't establish these priorities in your life, you you be someone journey without a compass. Priorities. That is what determine whether you look back or not. But first, it means they are changing their priorities. But first. So if you really want to escape this, you must address priorities. Dear believer, the word of God is important than anything. It doesn't admit that it's not necessary. It's necessary. But if even it's necessary, the word of God is more necessary than that. It's necessary to breathe. So it's necessary to breathe. But it's more necessary to receive the word of God. Do you know hearing this word of God now is necessary than any other thing that is necessary? But the thing is that what takes us away from the word of God are not even necessary. So you must know your priorities. Nothing shifts these coordinates. Anything that will come to shift them, that thing will rather be shifted. My love relationship with Christ, the word of God, and the third one is what? The purpose of God. Esther chapter 4, verse 14 to 15. The purpose of God. Esther chapter 4, verse 14 to 15. Let's add 16. Esther chapter 4, the purpose of God. 
For if you all together hold your peace at this time, then shall the enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house shall be destroyed. And who knows whether you are come to the kingdom for such a time as this. So Mordecai was touching on the purpose of Esther. The purpose for Esther's coming into the palace. What if the purpose, the intention of God, the providence of God for it is to come in for Israel at this time? When Haman had risen against Israel. And if Israel is annihilated, the Messiah will not come. Because the Lord prophesied before the founding of Israel in Genesis 3, 15, that the seed of the woman shall bruise the head of the serpent. Then he came and chose Abraham to be that line through which the Messiah will come. Through your seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed. So the annihilation of Israel is to make God a liar. The seed didn't come because the nation didn't exist and God has been a liar. The devil long wants to defame God all the time. That's how serious this is. But look at something that touches on the very honor of God. You have to take a lady to upset it. There is something going on in your family, something going on in your country, something going on in your generation that the devil wants to use to come against God big time to defame God or to truncate something that will bless generation. And as you sit here, as little as you see yourself, it is through you that that thing is to be avoided and God's glory is to be preserved for many. It is through you. Don't look down on your life. That's what Esther was doing. Esther was saying, this one of the ordinary things. Maybe it was by chance. Then Mordecai, you need a Mordecai and I speak as a Mordecai to you today. What if and the if is the reality it is for such a time as this. Ask yourself, why are you a Ghanaian? Ask yourself, why are you a female and not a male? Those who say that, you get up and say, I identify as a man, they are trying to say that there is no purpose to definiteness in nature. That's why you can just get up and change at any time. That's a lie. That's a lie. There is a reason why you are what you are. And you are from where you are from. They are all not in vain. If I wasn't a Ghanaian, I would have met you guys. And we'll be having this time for God to speak through me to bless as many. I would have seen such wonderful, beautiful faces. So nothing is in vain. You see, make it count. Tell yourself there's a significance to everything about you. There's a significance to everything about you. So Mordecai brought Esther into the right value. Esther decided to act on that. And this is what Esther said. Go. Gather together all the Jews that are present in Sushan. See, you haven't taken the action you need to take to change things because you think everything is ordinary. Oh, there is no, there is no reason to this. Today, some of you must hear the significance of even your temperament and go home and gather your tools. Gather into action. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Even the kind of parents you have it's not in vain. Yes. I once said, Prophet Manasseh said that even a person's height. <laughs> anyway, right action. Anyone who is passive just takes himself for granted, takes himself for granted, takes situations for granted. That's why they are passive. Yeah. No more in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. And fast ye for me, and neither eat nor drink three days. Night or day, I also and my maidens will likewise fast. And so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. I'm not preaching on Esther. It's a whole session on its own. This one, this thing, you can use it to trigger boldness in a lot of lives. But you see, he asks for fasting from without. And she herself says she and her maidens, they will also fast. But when it came to the action of destiny, she said, I will go. Beloved, I can pray to you. I can pray for you. We can pray with you. We can lay hands on you. But when it comes to the action of destiny, you would have to take it alone. You would have to. You would have to. No one can help you. Even receiving Jesus Christ, after all the lashes he took for you, he couldn't receive himself for you. 
You can never take responsibility out of existence. You say that you are ty tired of what? Tired of living for God. How can you be tired of living for God? The first priest is not tired of living for the devil. He's excited looking for the next project. You are tired of what? Tired of coming to church? Hey. No words. No words. I'm amazed. No words. No words. Take responsibility. There are some things only you can do, and until you do them, even what can change for a whole nation is not happening. Say it's up to me. It's up to me. Beat your chest. Say it's up to me. It's up to me. Right now, if you have to change your mind about certain things, it's up to you. We can just preach, we can just encourage, we can just exhort, but we can't change your mind for you. You have to say, no. The prodigal son, no matter how much the father loved him, you have to say, no. I'm not this, I'm like this. Your mood can swing at a moment if you decide, this one is up to me, I have to do it. Otherwise, you blame people, you, you even blame people for not following God. I, you see, I'm this guy right now, and then my family, I just want because a lot of you are young. And then my mother, and then my father, and then you think that excuse has enraged you, who we'll stand at the beamer. You understand? Yeah. If you, have, if you have gone for a work, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a contract, anything, that is a hindrance. Break it. I love you. I thought I loved you. <laughs> you are not married. If you are finding difficulty leaving any man, any woman, come and see me. I will help you. Special assistance. It's better than to miss your purpose. All right? No matter how far it's gone, so far as you are not married, it is divorce the Lord hates. He doesn't hate beloved's breaking up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And look at what she said. I will go. Though it is against the law, because you can't appear before the king if the king hasn't summoned you. And, and depending on the king, you can be killed. He said, if I lose my life in the course of pursuing my purpose, that for which I've been brought into the kingdom, then let it be. What she's saying is that the purpose for me being in the kingdom is more important than my life, such that if I lose my life and accomplish that purpose, I'll do it. You must have estimation that estimation that your purpose in existence is more important than your life. Are you listening to me? Are you listening to me? Yeah. Are you listening to me? Yeah. No, we must, we, we must have Christians of character. Christians of weight. Christians who have boldness and courage. That's how soldiers are trained. Now listen, the mission is very important. Stay on the mission. Say, but general, they are sure to know. Stay on mission. General, our mission is finished. Stay on mission. To them, the mission is more important. You are expendable. They tell you no one is above the mission. That is how come you see soldiers to be brave. Their bravery is from this training. If heaven will find you to be brave, you must develop this mindset that the purpose of God for a nation in which I'm a player is more important than my life. Let me be spent that souls may be free. That is what will cause you not to turn back. Listen, we, we, we Christians belong to a generation of brave men. Generation of brave women, generation of faithfulness, generation of people who do not look back. No retreat, no surrender was not just a title of a movie. It's the title of life. And it fits Christians more than any other. Time will fail me to tell you of souls who have stood faithfully, never looking back. And that same spirit that made them bold and brave like Esther is in you. It's in you. Say it's in me. You are brave. Say, I'm brave. I am brave. You know, Polycarp, Polycarp was a bishop in the early days of the Christian church, the early times. And he sent a missionary to Turkey. Turkey was then called Smyrna. Sorry, from Turkey, from Smyrna to France. France was then called Gaul. 
And this uh, uh, missionary, he sent him. Polycarp sent one called Pothinus to Leon. And Pothinus started the church there. Pothinus brought Christianity to Leon in France. They were under the Romans then. And what happened is that 20 years after, you know, the persecution that broke out there, you know, Christians were considered to be impious. The reason is because they were not engaging themselves in the civil religious practices because they were all worshipping idols, gods. And Christians would stay out. When those their festivals that celebrate the gods were up, Christians would abstain. So because of that, they were considered as impious. And eventually, the court declared that Christians were atheists. See, the way people are parading themselves with atheism like pride now, then it was a crime. So the devil just is playing mind games with souls. <laughs> he used that against Christians. He wants to use it in another way now. And you know, he says that because they don't believe in the gods, they are atheists. And that was a crime. So they were hated. They were not allowed in public places. They were, allowed, they were not allowed in baths, what you call swimming pool. Then they had public baths with steams and all that. They were not allowed there. They were not allowed in public places, the marketplaces. They were hated. That hatred, you haven't seen it yet. Maybe in the days of the Antichrist, then it will resurrect strongly. Then we see it. They were hated. You, you can't go to the marketplace and buy and sell. So what they did is that now... The holidays were up. It happened in August, so they had to entertain them. And then the, the, the ruler countered it. Why is that? To bring gladiators, you know, to entertain them and pay gladiators is expensive. So he'd rather use the Christians to entertain them. So he gathered them at the amphitheater and then get Christians and tie them or release them and let wild animals lions, bulls, chase them and just kill them. Yes, the way Christians were persecuted, you have no idea. But these Christians were following Jesus to become like him. They were working with Jesus to seek for lost souls. They were working with Jesus where he is. To make them what they were made to be. To restore this world into Eden. Do you know one of the punishments? It's called the barbecue chair. Yes. They hit the chair red hot. And if you are caught as a Christian, because becoming a Christian is a crime then, they make you sit on it. It's literally like putting the skin of a, a cow on a, on a hot metal with fire under. They call it barbecue and you chew. That's what they did to them. Imagine the chair you are sitting on. Fire is under and it's hot. And you sit on it naked. Yes, so your skin is burnt. Parthenos was 92 on this faithful episode of the persecutions, I'm telling you. 92 years. They arrested him. They kept him in a prison. You can go to Lyon now. Where Parthenos was kept is reserved. One day we'll go there. You, you, the prison is there. It's kept as a tourist attraction. The size of the prison is like the size of a dishwasher. Electric dishwasher. That's where they kept a 92-year-old man. He could not stand. They tortured him two days after he died. If they will not be merciful to a 92-year-old old man, then how about the youth and the children? One of them was Pontecos. Just 15 years. There was one called Sanctus. Sanctus was a deacon of, of, over the church in Vienna. Vien, that's what they call it. Sanctus. They made Sanctus sit on that red hot chair. It roasted him. It burnt him. They put hot, hot metal. They, they will hit. You see the way blacksmiths, mm -hmm. when they are well, they put the metal in till it is hot. When it is red hot, then they strike it. That's how they, they, they burnt it for the metal to be red hot. Red hot like that. And they attached it to vital parts of Sanctus' body, and some of the vital parts, you can imagine, everywhere, and it is there. Yes, Eusebius recorded it, you can go and study it. It is said that Sanctus' whole body was wounded side that he was 
a whole wound. It's different from Job's own. Job had wounds, 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 wounds. But Sanctus, it's like, if you look at him, you are looking at a whole wound. It's like, a, his whole body is a, is, is a whole wound, yet he's not dead. For following Christ. And why are they doing that? So that they will say that they won't follow Christ again. They will renounce him. Even them, they didn't look back. We don't care what this world will bring us to. We don't care whether we live or die. All we know is that our Savior must be seen. You see, that must be your burden. The most important thing is to become like Christ. And the only way you become like Christ, you'll be free of all this pain and bitterness and be full of love and bless your enemies is when you stick with Christ because only he can make you like him. And if even they want to kill you or peel your skin alive, you say that, come with me. I don't care. <laughs> Are you getting it? You don't, you don't change your priority. Change your priority. I pledge allegiance to the Lamb. They can take the Bible from me, but they will never take the Bible out of me. They can't stop me from eating the Bible. This should be your statement. You should say them. For I belong to the faithful ones. We don't give up. We don't look back. We don't change our minds. That's how you must be side up. That's how we think. That's who we are. It's not what we are trying to be. That's who we are. The one who saved us, it is in his genes. In this very context, in Luke 19, where he's talking about following, Jesus Christ himself modeled this. When the time came that he was to be received up, he set his face as a flint to Jerusalem. He had opportunity to change his mind. Yet he still stuck to it, to face the mission. He considered it more important than his life. Then from there, he teaches us how not to look back. Just as he didn't look back. It is in our genes. It is in our DNA. We are made just like him. We have his life in us. What made him faithful is in us. If the spirit of him that raised Christ from the dead dwell it in you. Say, I'm part of the faithful ones. Part of the faithful we are faithful ones. unto death. We are, faithful unto we, are death. we are not afraid of death. Not of suffering. Not of suffering. We, don't give up. we don't give up. We don't back down. Don't back down. It is in your blood. It's in your DNA. It runs in the family. It's in my blood, oh. It's in my DNA. This week be singing that song. It runs in the family. The faithfulness, the bravery, the not looking back, it is in your blood. Sing it into your consciousness. It is in your DNA. Though the righteous may fall seven times, he shall rise again. The word rise. The word rise. One time we'll look into it. You don't rise, you recover into strength. It's more than just another opportunity. It, it literally means that the fallen actually ends up contributing to you being stronger than you were before you fell. It tells you that there's something in us that cannot be kept down. That's the righteous. We don't give up. It's in the blood. It's in the DNA. We are not weaklings. We are not chickens. We are not chicks. Don't beat us down. That is you. Don't bury. Don't let the devil lie to you that you are unfaithful. We are like Pothinus. We are like Sanctus. We are like Blandina. Blandina was the last person to die from the Matado. She was a slave. A fragile looking girl. Probably like a duenna. Oh yes. You pity her. But you see the miracle is that they tortured them but Blandina was the last to die. One point they tortured her so much that the people torturing her were tired. They said we are tired. Yes yeah, she was still alive. And I've explained some of the torturings to you. Said there's no way. They said there's no way you should go through this torture and still be alive. Yet, she wasn't the strongest among them. She was the frail-looking one. You don't know the power in faithfulness. 
she said we are Christians we have done no evil I won't change I won't look back look forward to becoming like him and being what he has called me to be to turn this world into paradise see after they've tortured him and tortured him and tortured him and he wasn't dying the Lord strengthened him what happened is that they rode him they kept him in a net wrapped him in a net and throwed him into the amphitheater and the bulls played with her sorry her played with her played with her played with her played with her look at the pain look at the suffering yet in all of that my savior i love my savior i want my savior i will see but look at you what suffering have you seen what suffering has been done to you the christians you are practicing has no opposition you can read your bible free you can read it in a taxi you are not shy there's no hostility against you and you are saying that what but first what when there's no cause when there's no threat to even turn your back to christ you are turning your back to christ when all that you have are toys yeah, that's not you. I'm speaking to your DNA. That's not you. You don't back down. You don't give up. We smokers are growing strong in we smoking. Bible eaters, you want to backslide. You want to change your mind from being formed to become like Christ. Get that out of your head. Hit your head and say, come out. Come out. We don't give up. It is on to the end. And on to death. Let me tell you, we don't give up. We belong, we belong to a family that cannot, does not, do not give up. Because our father doesn't give up on us. Adam sold the whole world to the devil's hands. When the devil came, he told Jesus, all this were given to me and give it to anyone I want. Look at how he put the plans of God in a mess and elongated the process of the realization. But yet, the father gave him another chance. We don't give up. And Adam took it. And Adam bounced back. We don't give up. Look at Abraham. God called him and God said, I'll speak to you face to face. God said, you hear my voice every now and then. God said, I will lead you into the promised land. God said, through you that shall the family of the whole earth be blessed. God gave him promises. God showed himself faithful. He's the only one God physically entered into a covenant with. The flame, God came as a flame. He, he expressed all that. Yet, he doubted and went for Hagar to have a, a child by himself. He didn't walk with the Lord for more than 10 years. The Lord came and said, walk before me and be thou perfect. Even him, the Lord did not give up on him. The Lord's testimony about him is that he's a friend of God. Can I hide anything from Abraham, my friend? Abraham, he didn't stagger in his faith. You see, we are not people who stagger. That's our testimony. God doesn't give up on us. We don't give up. That's who we are. Abraham never gave up after his failures. You may say that, oh, I've slept with this person. Oh, I've done this thing. Oh, I've stolen this thing. So I'm counted out. I'm telling you, we don't give up. Are you listening to me? Yeah. What am I saying? We, we don't, don't give, give up. up. So don't let that cause you to look back. Don't let that cause you to deviate. Don't let that cause you to stop traveling. Abraham didn't stop traveling. Adam didn't stop traveling. Moses didn't stop traveling. He went ahead of God. He wanted to do it by himself. The pride of life had control of him early. By his hand, he wanted to deliver Israel. And that actually caused him to run into the backside of the desert. When the Lord appeared to me eventually to use him as he eagerly wanted, he didn't desire it anymore. He didn't want it anymore. He was full of doubt instead of even hope. But you see, we don't give up. The gifts and callings of God are without repentance. There's no scope of giving up in the realm of God. We don't want give up. And the end of Moses was stronger than even his initial attempt. The Pharaoh, that seat, that made him run. He shook that seat. They begged him to leave and eventually he drowned all of them. Who told you the devil lied to you that now he has finished you? Because of some mistakes you made, I'm telling your ancestry. I'm telling your genealogy. I'm telling you from where you come. And from where you come, tell us your capacities and capabilities. It is in your blood. It is in your DNA. You don't give up because your father never gives up on you. Time will fail me to tell you of David. What did he do? What didn't he do? He did what even Saul did not do. Take a man's wife 
and kill that man. Yet up till now, the throne Jesus will sit on is called the throne of David. Are you trying to say the throne of David, the wife snatcher? Are you trying to say the throne of David, the murderer? It's called the throne of David because we don't what? Give up. Murdering should not cause you to turn back. Snatching someone's wife should not cause you to turn back. That's what God is saying because he has caused your sins to be passed away from you. Now he's relating with the person who is clean before him. See, it is time to go on. It is time to march on. We are going forward. Hallelujah. Don't cause those things to cause you to step out of course. We are not stepping 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 out of course. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Greater is he that is in you than the sins you've committed. We are not stepping out of course. We are not stepping out of this, this course. We are not stepping out of this course. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Ah. See, Helen Roosevelt went as a missionary to Congo, a medical missionary, lived and ministered amongst them. Was able to manage a hospital that had 100 beds. Was having fruits. Civil war broke out in Congo. In 1964, they came to his place. They beat him, the rebels. They beat him. They beat him. He, he said that his mouth was full of sticky blood. He was beaten. She was beaten to the pulp. They pushed her to the floor. They would lift her up. Then, after, they took her to a room and they took turns to rape her. What did she do? She was a missionary. She's serving God. Where was God? When all these things were happening. Is that a reward for staying faithful to God to help others? But you know what she did? After her government came to evacuate them, after some years, she went back to Congo to do the same work. She went back to do the same work. She was not deterred. She was not discouraged, though she was discouraged for a moment. But you know what happened? We cannot be beaten down. We are not people who stay out of course. I'm telling you who you really are. Maybe you haven't discovered it. But it's in you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If anyone had a course to stay out of the purpose God has given her, then Helen Roosevelt is one of them. But she nursed her wounds, emotional, psychological, physical. And she went back into the same work. You say that that's a minefield of trauma. Because when you do the same thing again, it's full of triggers. In the same thing, you were raped, you were beaten. But you see, there is something in her that's greater than what happens around her. May you discover yourself in Jesus Christ. Amen. And you realize that with what he has made, what he has put in you, you are unstoppable. What did I say? You are unstoppable. What did I say? You are unstoppable. Put him first. Put his cause first. And all these energies will come alive within you. You'll be a working miracle. And the miracle is not in what he does for you. The miracle is in what you are in him. You're a miracle. You're a miracle. <laughs> Why do you sit like a defeated one when you are more than a conqueror? Complain about transportation. Complain about weather. Complain about people you live at home. When you, you live with a company, an ancestry that faced the worst, yet they didn't back down. Yet they didn't what? Back down. Yet they didn't stop them. It means no one can stop you. You are the one stopping yourself. In this journey of becoming like Christ, no one can stop you. Walking with God, no one can stop you. Working with God, no one can. If you see someone stopping you, it's a lie. No one can stop you. Ending up with the reward he has prepared for you, no one can stop you. Becoming the prayer giant you want to be, no one can stop you. Becoming the word addict you must be, no one can stop you. Becoming that loving personality in him, no one can stop you. Becoming that noble saint, no one can stop you. No one! Even the Roman Empire couldn't stop them. No one can stop you. Say, no one can stop me. No one can stop me. Nothing is stopping me. 
not even your past. What shall separate us from the love of God? Nothing. Not even your past. It has been dealt with by the blood. So those lists, Paul didn't mention the past because it doesn't exist. It has been dealt with by the blood. Bury the past. God is calling you forth. It is time to flame with Bury the past. God is calling you forth. It is time to flame with stronger passion than ever. We remember Ram Judson. And we pay homage to him. A man who left as a missionary to Burma, a strange land, at the age of 24. When he went to William Carey, who is known as the, mother of, the father of modern mission, to tell him about his exploits, his plans for Burma, William Carey told him, that place is a dangerous place. Even William Carey will advise himself. And that is where Aram Jason went. Do you know he had been married for just one year, six months, still in honeymoon season, and they left to a foreign land, Burma. And on their way, you know, the wife was already pregnant. On their way, while in the ship, they lost their first baby. They couldn't even give it a name. They lost the baby and they had to bury the baby. They had to throw the baby into the sea. What have you seen? What have you suffered? We haven't been challenged yet. Let's wake up. We haven't been challenged yet. And they who are the greatest challenge did the best that we have ever done. We have to sit up. Because one judge will judge all of us by the same standard. We have to sit up. <laughs> oh, Adam Judson, we honor you. When they got to Burma and they labored and they labored, the wife conceived again. They had a second child, they had a third child. But counting after the loss, they had two children. You know something? The first one died. The reason for the death is because the place is unhygienic. And in those days, development hadn't advanced like now. But they chose to raise their life at a place that has high mortality rates because of the unhygienic condition. So that those people will hear and become like Christ. The purpose is more important than their life. Now, the wife also died. Some time after, their child died. If it were you, you would say that demons have mounted upon your case. A lot of times, we call demons into our face, they have no dealings in, because we empower them by what we assign to them. Six months after, the other child died. Adam Jason was wifeless, childless. Yet he left America, coming to Burma, with strong hope and love for the loss in his heart, with a wife who was pregnant. He sits in Burma, wifeless and childless. He was losing his mind. He dug a grave of his wife, buried his wife. He dug his own grave and sat in it, just dangling his feet in the grave. He, he went mad. He went mad. He went mad. He could not do the work anymore. He went mad. Then he picked up himself and went back to the work. We do not give up. Not even the strongest challenges. That is the life we have. That is what you have been called into. That is what is in you. These things are food for the life in us, the resurrection in us. He went on to labor. He labored. In all this while, he hadn't even won one soul. He took six years. On the seventh year, he won his first soul. That, that first soul's same name is N. Aju. I don't know how they pronounce it in Burma, but it's N. Aju. He won his first soul. But you see, he, translate, he spent his time translating the Bible into Burmese. After now, his translation is one of the best blessings to the country of Burma. He was considered as a spy. He was arrested. He was kept in prison. He was turned upside down. Every evening, they would hang him upside down, tie his leg up. Imagine blood running down. Imagine. Yet you are like that all night. How heavy your head will be. But he resolved that if he's, if he's released from this prison, he will put himself to the work more than he's ever done. And if he doesn't leave, he knows God opened the door for more souls to take his place. But thanks be to God, he was released. Yes. 
Some eight years after his wife's death, he married again to a bored man. They had eight children, but some died because of the conditions. And eventually, even the second wife also fell sick, so sick that she wasn't recovering. So he had to carry her back to America. It was the first time that Ryan Jackson was facing going to America after 33 years of living there to Burma. 33 years. But on the way to America to save the wife's life, the wife died. Had to bury the wife on St. Helen Island. What is your challenge? Or for you, you have too much convenience. Today we resolve in Jesus' name. Amen. Say we resolve in Jesus' name. We resolve in Jesus' name. I want his statement to be your statement for your Christian life. Adam Jackson said, Enjoy your pain. Enjoy your sorrow. In health or pain. We sow on Bermes barren plain. We reap on Zion's hill. He said, Enjoy your sorrow. In health or pain, our course is onward still. And that is what this message, this scripture, what Jesus is telling us. That for what you will have, enjoy your sorrow in health or pain. Let your course be what? Onward still. The course is what? Onward still. It's walking with the Lord to be like him. It's working with him to have his discernment. It's growing in him to become what you must to manage this earth for him. The course is what? Onward still. Thank you for joining today's Voice of the Cross broadcast. If you have been blessed by this sermon, subscribe to our channel and turn on the notification button to be notified for our next broadcast.